All right, Don, are we good? You got your slides? Okay, we're, we're, we're live. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone who's here or in person or online. Uh, this is uh, workshop 468, broadband from space. Can it close the digital divide? That's our question. Uh, the setup for this is the idea that we've entered a new era of satellite communications. They're not new satellites, they've been around for a long time, but we're seeing new types of satellites that have new capabilities, especially in low Earth orbit. We'll hear about that shortly. Uh, and the possibility of satellites in multiple orbits coordinating to create new kinds of services. Uh, my name is Don Means. I'm the director of the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, each of our speakers will introduce themselves. Uh, our time is short today, so we're going to try to get through this pretty quickly and have time for open discussions. Um, I just wanted to make a, a couple of points in the beginning here about uh, barriers to adoption. The, the, the question that we're posing here is can satellites actually close the digital divide? Can they contribute to this solution, to this long-standing problem uh, that, we've, that we've had? Uh, the reason we've had this problem is just the basic economics of infrastructure that says the farther away you are from the core of any network, the more expensive it is to reach you, and you probably have less money uh, to boot. So that's why there are three billion plus people that are still not participating in the uh, global digital conversation. We've identified these three barriers as availability, uh, affordability, and usability. So affordability, of course, is a different, difficult question if you approach it from the standpoint of what, how much can a family afford to spend every month for access. It depends on how the value is set. What, what can they gain from that? Does it change their economic calculation in the first place? Like, you buy a car because it allows you to go to a job. Could you afford it without the job? That kind of a thing. Usability is the most mm, comprehensive or, or largest uh, kind of topic here because it covers everything from skills to devices to an environment. Uh, and, but it's absolutely uh, critical to adoption. Availability is, is slightly different because if you don't have availability, then affordability and usability are moot questions. So that's what's interesting about satellites, especially low Earth orbit satellites, is they can connect anyone, anywhere, uh, given that the country has given them permission to operate, uh, with high performance, robust broadband, low latency, 100 megabit uh, connections. There are lots of issues around this uh, related to, well, I'm not going to get into all those, but there are. We hopefully we'll get into those. So the, the goal here, at least from Gigabit Library's network standpoint, is this is the, a real opportunity to connect every community. Now, this is not connect every person or every household. That's a dream, but it's, it's a reality that we could set up a community hub in every community. I mean, if we come up with a number, it's 100,000 or some number of communities, either the neighborhoods or, or small communities everywhere, that's doable. And what, what do you have with that? What do you have with this a community uh, network that is basically no fee or low fee? Well, those are, those are questions. But for us, this, this is a, a baseline standard functionality to allow virtually everyone access, even if it's not everything that everybody wants. It's something that is there for everybody. So we're going to hear more about what that means and what are the implications of that and how the technology is built and what makes it different from our next speaker, which is Dan York with the Internet Society. Dan, welcome. And Dan is also the co-coordinator co of the session. Dan? Sure. Thank you, Don. Welcome to everybody. Um, I am Delighted that we're having this session, having this conversation. You should now be able to see my uh, screen, correct? Okay. So I, my role here is really to talk about a bit about the technology and to help us understand this as we look at this discussion and this debate. As Don mentioned, satellites are not new. 
for internet access. We've had them for decades, really. And they have been satellites that are in, in the geosynchronous or geostationary. Um, and, and those are ones that are way out at 36,000 kilometers. They have the great capability that they can basically be parked over one part of the Earth and you can have basically three of them and be able to get worldwide global connectivity. The challenge is they're expensive. They're typically the size of a large bus. They take years to create, millions upon millions of dollars, and they're launched out into that, uh, that distant orbit, which is great. It has provided internet access to people all around the world. But as a challenge, that it takes a long time for a packet to go from the Earth out to that satellite and back. In networking terms, we talk about latency or the lag, the amount of delay, and that can be 600, 700 milliseconds, even a second, and that's that would be impossible for me to come in over a this Zoom connection. I could not do that. So the exciting part about why we're here is this new generation of satellites that are that operate in low Earth orbit, which is the opposite side of that that is down underneath 2000 kilometers. There is a medium earth orbit, which is in between those two areas. And there are a couple of solutions. There's one company, um, SES, which operates a, a network of satellites. And there you can have fewer, you can only need maybe 11 or 20 satellites, but they're in, in motion and they have longer latency times. But the excitement is all down in LEOs because now we have things that can have very quick acts, uh, low latency. So you can have maybe 40 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, which is well within the range of things like video communication and pieces like that. The challenge is that you need more satellites. And so our picture looks a lot more like this as we start to grow this. And I'll talk about this in a little bit. The components when you, and this interest is coming about because we have this demand for these high speed, low latency connections. Um, there's also been this massive reduction in costs for satellite development. If you are watching this space, you can see the companies like SpaceX and Amazon are in fact, you know, they're mass producing satellites. I think I saw a report from one of Amazon's things. They're able to pump out four a day out of their factories. SpaceX is similar. They're, they're creating large numbers of this. And we've seen this massive reduction in the cost of launching SpaceX with its reusable rockets and pieces like that. The three components, <clears throat> which are critical, and, and Berna will get to this when she talks about the policy side, are that you have the satellite constellation, which is, of course, what we all know or we, we talk about. You also have the thing on the ground. Now, the satellite industry calls this the, uh, a user terminal or a, um, a ground terminal or something like that. For a consumer, we might talk about it as just the antenna or the dish or something like that. It's a little different from the past in with traditional satellites, you had a fixed antenna that you put on the side of a house and you pointed out at the satellite. And that worked because the satellite was always in a location. These antennas look more like a pizza box. They have electronics in them to be able to interact with multiple satellites. And, and they're very different. They also sometimes have an access point. It's, it's packaged differently in different ways. And then you have these ground stations, which are also called gateways. And those are important pieces of, of, of how this all works. And let me just show a quick picture to show how this works in one way. <clears throat> Your satellite connection goes up, bounces off a satellite, and gets down to a ground station. In LEO environments, you're actually probably interacting with at least one or two satellites. The satellites are typically overhead for about five minutes. And so you are um, and so you you have multiple satellites. And that's part of the what happens with these antennas that are there. Now, one interesting development that's happened with LEOs that's made it even more interesting is some communication between satellites. Because before, and with traditional satellites, you had to always be in range of a ground station. And so that meant that you could only interact, you had to have a ground station every maybe 900 kilometers or so across the Earth. Now, the satellites are actually able to connect in between them, called, using what are called inter-satellite lasers. And this allows you to connect to a satellite, go across the Starlink constellation in this case, and then drop down to a ground station. SpaceX has pioneered this with, with Starlink. All the others who are out there are, are doing looking at similar kinds of ways. And so it provides some interesting aspects to be able to connect people in very remote areas.
that are far away from where you might be able to have a ground station. Uh, the Internet Society did create a document about this. You can get it at internetsociety.org slash leos. It's there. It's something you can be able to look at that goes through a lot of these questions and things. I want to just touch on a couple before I pass it on here. Don mentioned the big ability, the question around affordability. Can we actually make this affordable to everybody who needs it? Will it have the capacity to handle everybody's devices? Because we want to go and connect. Everybody has many devices they want to connect. Um, the big question from a technical point of view, quite honestly, right now in 2023, is getting the satellites up there is one of the big challenges we have right now. It turns out that at this moment in time, SpaceX is the only provider that's really operating at scale. There's a number of other launch providers that are working in this area, but they're all caught in transitions right now between rockets. Uh, the United Launch, launch Alliance, which is a traditional uh, U.S. provider, has been around for decades they're in the middle of going from an Atlas V to the Vulcan Centaur. Ariane Space is in, has run out of its Ariane 5, is, but its Ariane 6 is delayed. All of these things have caused uh, a, a delay in us getting there. It should be temporary, but it is one of the challenges right now in getting these systems up there. There are smaller launch providers, but one big question is, can they launch at the scale? And to give you an, an illustration of that, just in the past two months, Starlink has launched, SpaceX has launched uh, seven rockets each month. Just this month, they've launched two already. They were supposed to launch one this morning, actually, but it got delayed because of some high winds, and now they're just trying to figure out when. But this gives an example of the scale that is needed to go and, and launch at this kind of level to provide this kind of support. We'll talk. We have our paper outlines and we have room here to talk about some of these questions around security, privacy, interoperability, space debris is a big question. We're, there are questions we don't know yet. We don't know whether all of these different um, proposals can actually work. We're not clear on the environmental impact of launching all of these rockets and also of having these satellites burn up in the upper atmosphere. And there is a strong concern about impact on astronomy and pieces, which we don't yet understand. So the, the reason we need to be having this conversation here at IGF and in other venues is that there is a lot of activity in the space. Over the next few years, we're expecting to see Starlink complete its first phase, what it calls its generation one, and go on toward its next one. Right now, it's going to, the first one is about 4,400 satellites. The next shell, the next part of the constellation has been approved for 7,500 and is going on toward ultimately around 30,000 satellites. OneWeb has completed its, which is now part of UtilSat, so it's actually now UtilSat OneWeb. They've completed their initial group, but they're looking to go on toward built a second phase. Amazon's Project Kuiper, just this past week, successfully launched its first set two satellites for demonstration, but assuming all goes well, they're looking in the first half of 2024 to begin launching, growing up to around 3,200 satellites over the next while. China is, is look from what we can tell from the outside, is looking to build its own competitor, Starlink, which will be around 13,000 satellites or so, 14,000. And the EU, the European Union, is looking to create what it calls its Iris II constellation. So the timing, the reason we need to be having these conversations is to understand that over the next five years or so, there's going to be a massive amount of, of capacity coming up there online, the opportunities are tremendous. Uh, you know, and just to give you a sense of the satellites that are here, it's conceivable from the filings with the International Telecommunications Union that we could see 40,000, 50,000, maybe even 60 or maybe even 90,000. It's, it's hard to know how many of these will actually make it into space and be able to work. But it's a huge number of satellites. There's a huge opportunity uh, but there's also a lot of questions and things we just need to understand around Don's points around affordability, availability, and also usability. So with that, I want to just say thank you, and I look forward to answering questions as we go through this more. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Very nice summary there. Uh, so now we will turn to uh, Nikem Wege. I, I never get that right quite, Nikem, 
but welcome. Uh, Nakim has uh, been working on a project in Nigeria with libraries there. Uh, Nakim, please introduce yourself and tell us what you've been up to with these satellites. Unmute, Nakim. Oh, apologies. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, thank you very much. So I am Kem Mostigwe. I am a librarian. I work for the African Library and Information Associations and Institutions with headquarters in Accra, Ghana. That is AFLIA. And when Don started talking about this um, new libraries, you know, this um, satellite thing, it, it was like, is it possible? I don't know how it's going to happen. Can we afford it? Who can afford it in, um, in uh, Africa? Then um, through uh, his engagement, we were able to get um, uh, free internet using Starlink for five libraries in Nigeria, one in Lagos in, um, in the city center. Then we have three in Abuja and one in Kaduna. These are really urban areas. And um, what I had envisaged was that maybe it could be possible in rural, in rural areas, but I think that the rollout first was uh, to um, urban areas. So we got those five um, around uh, from June. We took delivery between June 6th to around June 29th of this year, 2023. Initially, there were plenty of challenges in setting them up. There were issues. In, in fact, I, I, I took a picture, I, I took a picture of, um, of a library in, in Abuja that had complained that um, they were not getting the internet after it, um, the um, unit was set up. And it was because of the uh, trees that covered the, um, the uh, dish, so to speak. But right now, all of them are, the, the five of them are up and running. There are still some challenges because uh, they are saying that uh, the, um, the coverage doesn't extend much to outside of the libraries. Because when, when I, was, I was telling them about it, I asked them to imagine a situation where something like maybe, we hope not, COVID-19 happens again. What happens? What happens when the library doors are closed? Can they still be able to offer services, even if it's only um, internet services? So um, right now, the internet is strong, fast, stable. Inside of um, the libraries, within particular areas of the libraries, but once you move outside a little bit, it, the signals become weak. Now, we had asked them to, we had asked the libraries to find out um, who, who will benefit most from this or who can benefit most from this, this free and fast internet. And my idea, my idea was, you know, um, young people um, that are seeking for employment opportunities or, or want to learn digital skills or... Or, or want to assess the ass assignment or lifelong um, learners. But there was, I didn't envisage another critical group. And when I found this out, it, it, you know, it, it kind of um, made me uh, <laughs> elated that, oh, so this is possible too. We didn't configure in the open community, the open knowledge community in Nigeria. Who are these people? People that uh, like the um, Wikimedia users group. We have quite a, a number of them in, in um, Nigeria. You know, Nigeria, we have more than 500 languages. And some of these groups, um, are, and some of them all have um, user groups within Wikimedia. And why am I talking about them? In particular, if you have ever edited any of the Wikimedia projects, you find out that if your internet is slow, once you edit and you want to publish, it, 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 it kind of hangs. But with this now, the people, um, those of them that use the uh, library, because um, we introduced the um, internet to, to them, 
And they say that when they go there to edit, whatever they edit, it just goes fast like that. It doesn't hang up. It doesn't, um, it, it doesn't give them much um, issues. And also then we, we're also working with um, open license and um, OER enthusiasts. Because uh, we are beginning to realize that most of the knowledge resources, educational resources, stories, and so on, we hardly find those in mother tongues. And considering the fact that we have so many languages in Nigeria, we are beginning to ask librarians and others to please use some open, um, open platforms where we have storybooks for children to translate them into um, our local languages. And they've been using the internet a lot, quite for that, you know, quite a lot on, on that. And then um, right now we have a digital library on, um, on Story Weaver, and we are building another one on uh, African Storybook. And all these things are made possible because of um, this internet from Stalin that makes it easier easier for you to translate because when you translate a story on um, these platforms or when you're translating, the internet slows down and you started or, you know, you get tired. But now with that fast internet is, um, is really better for, for, um, for libraries in Nigeria. These five libraries that uh, um, have free internet from Starlink. And um, for, for the National Library of Nigeria, that they have it in Lagos, in uh, Abuja and Kaduna. You know, they are saying that it's a game changer, that although the, 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 the traditional library users, those ones that uh, we are sure will always use the library, it's not, as if they've, um, that, it's not as if they make use of it so much, but it's really the new people that are being attracted to the library because of the internet that are, are making use of it, especially, like I said, the um, Wikimedia group, um, users group, and then the open license enthusiasts, and those that uh, are interested in um, OER and stuff like that. So that is what I can say now about what we are doing in um, Nigeria with this. But um, we, we had a meeting in... Um, we had a meeting in, uh, on September 26th. Dawn was there most of the time. I wasn't there most of the time, but uh, I, I, I spoke with them again uh, this morning and I asked them that there are things that we need to do. And that thing that we need to do is to collect more and more data. You know, who are these people that are now using this internet? You know, because they are slightly different from our regular users. What's their age range? What do they do? You know, how, how, what stories do they have about the use of the, um, this internet? Then what's the speed for them? Does it drop, the, the, um, does the speed drop at a particular point in the, in the day and so on? But the challenge also is that, you know, because um, these are all government libraries. They work only from Monday to Friday. They don't work on Saturday. So we are trying to see how to get staff to run shifts so that they can run, they, they can open on Saturdays for, for others that um, need them on those days. Then also, um, you know, one, yeah, hello. Can you wrap up? We'll have questions. All right. Oh, okay, okay, oh, okay. Once light goes off, you know the router stops. It becomes um, a problem. Uh, if 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 the routers came with inbuilt inverter libraries and um, batteries, maybe that could be better for us. Thank you very much. Okay. Done. Thank you. I'm done. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, there's a, a slide of uh, the dish mounted on a mast to get elevation. Uh, some, some flyers that went out uh, around Lagos and Abuja to show this new service was available. And 
people are word of mouth is getting around. People are interested in they're coming in. Uh, Stephen Weiber will uh, talk to us here. Stephen's with the International Federation of Library Associations, a longtime associate. Uh, and we talk about this uh, hub concept for sharing. And so, Stephen, what's the, what's the best hub? Thank you. So um, I, I think I, I'm going to sort of build on what Kem said in a less enthusiastic way, g given where I come from. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that makes libraries interesting here is that we are a pre-digital public infrastructure, <laughs> that it, it's an infrastructure that was there ahead of the internet in order to help actually achieve goals in real life in order to help people improve their lives through access to information, through access to knowledge. And so what they're doing is trying to apply to make the most of the opportunities that digital tools provide, but with those same goals of actually making a real difference. And I think it's something that really came out in what Ken was saying was that what libraries are doing by bring in the Starlink connections by drawing on the satellite internet connections is actually um, it's making the difference between availability and impact. As you talked at the beginning that okay, obviously you can make things available but then how do you actually make that bridge from availability to full on impact and that's what the libraries are doing and it's through some of the more basic things about simply it being free access and so there's not a paywall, there's not that sort of limitation on access, but it's also through the fact that you have a, a staff and a space that are actually dedicated to thinking through what, how do we make a difference, not just we provide something and see what happens, but actually thinking it through. And I think that there's a number of, of characteristics ab about libraries and about the, the, the philosophy and the modus operandi of libraries that, that mean that they're pretty well placed to do that. And I think some of these actually resonate quite well with the, the themes picked for this uh, I, I, IGF. Um, I think there's a, I don't know, the talk about meaningful connectivity and the fact of connectivity being more than just about a cable or a satellite link or whatever is, is something that's been at the heart of what the way that libraries have worked with the internet for a very long time. It's not, I don't know, the success of the internet is not measured in the number of people covered by a signal. The success of the internet is measured in how many people's lives are improved. There's a strong focus on it being rights-based, that everyone has this right to access to information, to be able to use information to improve their lives. I think beyond that, there's the role of libraries in localizing, in thinking about the context and thinking about what's going to work building on their knowledge of their communities and really being responsive to the needs of individuals. And we can highlight the interest of libraries as being a public interest and known location within the community. Mm -hmm. There was a fantastic example of an internet backpack, so another technology for bringing people online in Ghana, and they used the library because it was the one place where all the local schools felt it was okay to come and it was okay to be the center in order to get people online. Um, uh, two other things to mention, I think there's the potential of, of libraries as a, a federator. Again, they're not seen as wanting to shift their weight around or try and dominate things, but they have proven to be quite good in a whole variety of different settings in taking all the different local actors, bringing them together in order to think how collectively can we make the most of connectivity. And I think in Kem's examples of working with Wikimedia chapters, working with different groups is really powerful here. And then I think that the final point I'd say is that libraries are not just about connectivity. Um, at, at the risk of sounding rude, um, once upon a time there was the idea that internet cafes and telecenters would take over from libraries, but it's not, that's not been the case. I don't know, we don't really talk about telecenters anymore because um, they were a purely digital infrastructure. Um, with libraries, you have a pre-existing infrastructure that offers other services that has a whole variety of ways of adding value. And I think that's also probably what helps make it. And, and I think the examples that Don has supported in the US and the examples that Kem's been involved in in Nigeria demonstrate that when you add connectivity to this mix, you can really make things happen. And you can really make sure, as said, that we make that link between availability and impact. Very good. 
uh, that said, uh, I mean, libraries represent to us anyway the, the, the quintessential example of a, of a community uh, center. Uh, but if there is a center that uh, the community supports and trusts, fine. It's just that the library offers a certain model for a range of services, support services, training, mm -hmm. all the things Stephen mentioned that make it uh, a go-to uh, in the absence of an alternative. So uh, now we'll hear from Berna Gur, uh, who's with uh, Queen Mary University at London, uh, about uh, various law and policy aspects of this, which there are not a small number. And then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, please send them in uh, through the chat or wait for the opportunity after, after Berna finishes. Thank you. Berna, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, um, it's a pleasure to be here with such distinguished uh, panelists, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, my intervention will focus on um, the regulatory and policy aspects of satellite broadband with a particular emphasis on addressing the global digital divide. Um, here at IGF, as an international community, we strive to achieve a more equitable internet use that reduces global inequalities rather than increases mm -hmm. them. And it's only when connectivity becomes universal and meaningful, it can be utilized to create social and economic impact, which can lead to economic development and innovation. Now, meaningful connectivity has broader requirements. But the underlying communications infrastructure for universal access remains crucial. Recent advancements in space-based technologies, particularly mega constellations like Starlink, um, offer a promising solution for providing broadband services globally with minimal additional terrestrial infrastructure. This technology does not have to be considered as a standalone solution. It complements existing global communication infrastructures. However, its successful integration at the domestic level requires careful consideration of each country's unique circumstances and needs, as well as domestic laws and their international law commitments. So first, the policymakers and regulators shall make informed decisions by consulting other stakeholders about the best way to utilize this. They can then intervene by utilizing laws and regulations to maximize its benefits. They will not need to start from zero as there are already, there's already an understanding of how satellite services are regulated at the national and international level. To start with, the provision of satellite services in a particular country is subject to that country's laws and regulations. These are called landing rights, and the countries decide uh, for themselves the terms of landing rights. Satellite communications are not new, so the regulations of, um, regarding landing rights are already in place in almost all jurisdictions. These regulations, however, at times need to be adjusted to the unique circumstances, requirements of technological advancements. Mega constellations, I believe, qualify as such. Let's start with the ground station, the gateway. Dan explains satellite systems connect to the internet through these ground stations. They need to be, at the moment, the Starlink technology, need to be set up at least every 1,000 kilometers. For that, they will need authorization from each relevant jurisdiction. Let's say that your country has a smaller surface area and there's a ground station uh, in one of your neighbors. Do you want to use theirs? It means that you will rely on your neighbor to not, to not disrupt your services at all times. There may be other cybersecurity implications as well. In another example, let's say that your country has a very large surface area, you may need uh, regulators to facilitate the authorization of more than one ground station. Suppose you want to create a competitive environment by authorizing multiple satellite broadband companies. 
In that case, you will need to arrange the location of these ground stations to avoid interfering with each other's services and all other wireless services in the area. The United Kingdom's regulatory agency, Ofcom, for example, has been very proactive in updating its regulations through frequent consultations with, um, <coughs> with various stakeholders. Now, th this brings us to the use of frequency spectrum. The satellites require the use of assigned frequency spectrum for their uplink and downlink connection with the user terminals and also the ground stations. The frequency spectrum is a limited natural resource, the global coordination of which is uh, which ITU regulates. Under the coordination requirements of the ITU, the frequency spectrum assignment in a particular country is subject to their jurisdiction, but coordination at international and domestic levels is necessary for uninterrupted provision of all wireless services, including mobile connectivity and satellites. The coexistence of operators in proximity may require technical cooperation amongst, amongst themselves. A licensing requirement for licensees to cooperate with each other may be a good solution to resolve this problem. So th the range of these licenses and authorizations also changes with the business model. For example, Starlink's direct-to-consumer model would likely require an internet service provider license whereas OneWeb plans to provide backhaul services primarily to incumbent telecom operators. These are subject to different, uh, they will be subject to different narrower set of regulations. Another essential component of the satellite systems are the user terminals. Satellite broadband companies need to export equipment to facilitate the use of their services. The use and importation of user terminals are subject to licensing and import requirements of the national authorities. These terminals must be installed at the user's premises and have been subject to standards and conformity assessment procedures by national regulatory agencies. Sometimes these licenses are combined with the um, internet service provider license. From an international law perspective, the treaty obligations under the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, shortly GATT, and the Information Technology Agreement, plus preferential trade agreements, can become relevant. Regulators will have to check their commitments under the, these agreements. The customs duties applicable to user terminals will be an affordability, uh, will, will be important to the affordability issue especially for Leo broadband companies planning to provide their services directly to consumers. Again, depending on the type of service, data governance regimes and privacy concerns may come into the picture. Shortly, what I'm saying is that host countries are expected to comply with their international law commitments when exercising their domestic regulatory powers. It is an extensive subject, so if you find this topic interesting, and want to learn more, um, you could take a look at our research uh, project funded by ISOC Foundation. There's a report on the global governance of satellite broadband, which covers the topics that I um, mentioned here. And there are shorter policy papers for governments and civil society orga organizations, as well as links to academic papers if you are interested. I want to conclude my intervention by referring to our policy paper. We advise developing countries to reevaluate and update domestic regulations related to licensing and authori authorizing satellite broadband services, consider different business models, and the potential impact on cybersecurity and autonomy when deciding on gateways. Forming regional alliances can enhance the achievement of policy goals. Two. Participate actively in the International Telecommunications Union, which manages limited natural resources like frequency spectrum and orbital resources. Members should engage in decision-making processes, especially at world radio conferences. If this is done through regional alliances, it will again enhance achieving desired outcomes. Three, reassess commitments under trade treaties. Consider interests and priorities associated with satellite broadband technology. And the last one, participate in the UN Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, 
and take advantage of capacity building opportunities offered by the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs. Awareness of international space law is essential to make informed decisions. By holistically considering these actions, countries can ensure that their initiatives align with their sustainable development goals, technological autonomy, and cybersecurity con considerations. Thank you. Thank you, Berna. Uh, <laughs> you've, you've made the point that uh, this whole system is incredibly complicated on so many levels. Uh, the, the intellectual property, the licensing, the technology, the multiple technologies, uh, the ecosystem. Uh, we're really just at the beginning, and I, I wanted to make that point uh, first, that, that this is not an advocacy, if it sounds like that, for this new technology. It is, however, I would say an advocacy for exploring this technology. And everyone who's worried or concerned with uh, uh, bridging this actual digital divide for people that are beyond the terrestrial infrastructure especially, or as a backup for people that are connected, uh, should know firsthand how this technology works. Uh, it's still unfolding, the prices change, there, there are so many questions about it. Uh, uh, before I'm going to ask for any questions from our live audience, I want to give Dan, uh, organizer prerogative, to make a follow-up comment on Berna's presentation. Dan? Sure. Thank you, Don, um, and thank you, Berna. That was great. I want to just emphasize one key point, partly that you said that it is um, uh, that it is new. It is emerging, right? I mean, two years ago, we didn't have this capability at the way we do. Uh, right now, we have primarily Starlink is our only option for this kind of connectivity. OneWeb expects to go live with their systems later this year to have connectivity by the end of 2023, they say. Um, and, and Amazon's looking to get theirs up by the end of 2024. So many more. The important point is, this is an incredibly dynamic and evolving space. One other deployment challenge, I just want to build on what Berna said. If you look at what she talked about with each country, when I started this work, I naively thought that, you know, you could just, once these things were up there, you could bring a dish anywhere and it would just work. And, and technically, it actually could. But the reality is all of that legal, all of those conventions that Berna mentioned are critical. And one question we often see from people is when will, you know, Starlink or OneWeb or anybody be available in my country? And it comes back to what Berna showed on that slide. In each and every country, the regulator needs to approve the spectrum that is being used for the uplink and the downlink between the, the systems also has to approve that user terminal equipment to be distributed. And so there's a lot of regulatory work. These providers, whether it's SpaceX or OneWeb or, or Amazon, they have large teams of staff whose job it is just to go and talk to the regulators of each country. And another critical piece that, that Berna indicated was this sharing of spectrum. There are some countries that actually can't use any of these systems because the frequencies that are needed are being used by that country's existing um, government systems worth of pieces. So there's a lot of complexity in turning it on for each individual country around the world. So uh, it's an exciting time, but there's a lot of complexity and I see already some fantastic questions that people are asking. So thank you all for paying attention and for being here. Thank you, Dan. Uh, complexity is the word. Uh, in spite of the fact that the technology itself from the user standpoint is actually plug and play. Uh, we have a question from, from the audience here. Uh, please identify yourself and try to make it quick. Hello, my name is Uta Meyer hahn I'm uh, with GIZ, which is the German Agency for International Cooperation. Uh, we also look at this topic, and I would like to leave one very short remark and a question. The very short remark adds to the very specific title of this session, how Leo Satellite Internet can contribute to closing the digital divide. And one thing that I have not heard, but that I find particularly important is um, when presented with the uh, with the argument that Leo satellite is so expensive and that it's so unknown and it's so uncertain and, and all the other limitations um, and why we shouldn't be more active in supporting other kinds of infrastructure, terrestrial infrastructure, mobile infrastructure, um, then I think it is important to remember that the digital divide grows larger with time. So it's very important to 
start closing it quickly, and that is one of the very specific qualities of LEO satellite internet, that it allows deployment much quicker than the build out of terrestrial or mobile infrastructure. So it has a role in complementing these efforts. That's, I feel like that is uh, good to add. And my question relates to the coordination specifically among countries that uh, inquire about the use of LEO satellite internet and that try to choose providers, at this moment there's not so much to choose, but um, with a view to the future and the past, um, first the past that has shown that sometimes um, providers may not live long, but um, integrating their services requires from those countries to make investments, both in hardware and in establishing the institutional setup, as you just said. Um, there may be the assumption that the sort of the power as consumers, if we regard those countries as consumers, could be enlarged vis-a-vis -vis providers to have uh, good conditions by coordinating. And my question to the panel goes to the direction of how you would suggest improved coordination among those, if you will, customer countries. Thank you. Wow, there's a lot we could unpack yeah, there. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the, we, we actually didn't mention politics in, uh, among the comp various complexities, and certainly in telecommunications, it's ra just rife with, with politics. Uh, uh, how you integrate that into the ecosystem is, is a challenge in every country as well, uh, and the business model and the, the ecosystem impact is, is another uh, TBD. Uh, Dan? Yeah, I, I think one of the interesting aspects you mentioned was the quick deployment, and that is the, a critical element. You can drop a, a, a Leo's dish anywhere, and you can be in, in a country that has that permission. And as long as you can get power to it, right, you can get that access and be able to provide that. Um, we see it certainly as a complement to existing infrastructure. You know, if you, we talk about a low latency in, in Leo connection, Obviously, you can get even lower latency in fiber, right? If you can get a fiber connection, you can get a fully synchronous, higher, even higher speed, lower latency. That's great. But the challenge is you can't get fiber everywhere, right? And so there's a, there's a complementary aspect to this. There's also a really interesting aspect, which is that Leo connectivity can get out there first and can actually build the interest and usability and and, um, and help people build the digital skills to be using internet connectivity so that when other terrestrial um, you know, connectivity can catch up to that, they find that the people are already excited and interested and want that. So sometimes, I mean, there is a tension between terrestrial providers and the space-based, the newer space-based providers. But one interesting aspect is they actually work really well and, and one can lead to the other and can support both in there. That coordination among countries, one challenge that we have at the moment globally is that everybody's looking to build their own systems, right? SpaceX has its own ground stations, its own antennas, its own systems. OneWeb has its own antennas, its own ground stations. Amazon's Kuiper is doing the same thing. So we're building multiple infrastructures. We'd love it if they cooperate, interoperate more, but these are commercial entities that are on their own market space around that. So we'll have to see. Um, as far as the international cooperation, perhaps Berna could speak to that, I'm not. Dan, we've got actually quite a, bit, quite a few questions and we're running low on time. Uh, there was one online, maybe you could address that, uh, related to the uh, reselling. This has been a, a, yeah. a big question about uh, uh, Starlink and their licenses and the ability to use it as backhaul for commercial or even open community networks. Yeah, and this is <laughs> this is an open question, and and we don't know the answer precisely. But this the question is really, you know, if you get your Starlink connection, can you then resell it to other people? Can you do other things like that? This goes to what Berna mentioned about the different business models. Starlink right now is very focused on a direct consumer, a one-to-one -one relationship. So you build, you get an antenna, you go and you use it for yourself or your library or your piece. OneWeb, their business model is very much focused on reselling. So their model is to work with partners, to work with people 
um, to um, to be able to uh, to resell that service. So that's they have a very different model in that. Amazon has indicated that they're also going to do the direct to consumer model, but in all those cases, they're testing other models too. So I think we don't have a definitive answer right now around that. I know in some cases, Starlink has allowed their connection to be used as backhaul into a community network with the connect, the backhaul being the connection back to the rest of the internet. So they have allowed that. Not clear yet whether that's broadly applicable or whether they're doing it on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's one area I think we just have to kind of watch what models happen here. And actually part of what that model is by, by testing out those limits uh, in fact. And so what, what will they permit? The, the Starlink business model continues itself to evolve rapidly. They change their pricing structures and their licensing, and they go for different markets, uh, the end user consumer market, and now into commercial use, ships, planes, so it's, it's highly dynamic, the business model. So I just would encourage everybody to uh, uh, try one out and see what you can do with it and see when they start to object. We have, it looks like three people here in the room. Could you each ask your question briefly all at once and we'll try to get to all of them. Hello. Sir, introduce okay. yourself. Yeah, okay. Um, my name is Nils Brock from DW Academy and from Rhizomatica. I wanted to make this longer, but uh, I will make it really short. Uh, I think there's an underlying, undermining question, with, which is ecology. So, and you said there are many doubts. Um, my question, I will turn it around. Firing up uh, 10 thousands of satellites in space, satellites that have to be renewed every five years. So. Why do you put this as a rhetorical question, if this is sustainable or not? So please tell me, what gives, give me one argument why you think this is environmentally sustainable as a technology. So I don't see it, and I think this kind of, we have to see there is a competence, and maybe, yeah, there are the companies competing I against each other. Let's see what happens in five years. Do we have this time? And this question, well, would come from my daughter, 11 years old, not having a cell phone, opting out because we're all crazy and fucking it up causing uh, on the resources. Thanks. Good question. Yeah, and it's an excellent question, and there's nope. lots more. Uh, Dan, think, let's, let's, get, let's collect some questions. We'll, we'll kind of answer all of them. That's a good one. Sounds good. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Okay, plus one to the environmental question. Um, the other question is just about uh, the regulation or observation of the people who are putting these uh, satellites into space, especially when they're able to turn them off or throttle or change the service provided. They're sort of at the whims of these individuals. How do we monitor that? What's the accountability structure? Um, and and uh, and then also just to give a raise a raise a, a hand that we are a nonprofit called Measurement Lab that measures the interconnection points, speed, and quality of the internet around the world, and are very interested in being able to monitor the satellite space. So if anybody is curious about making that data public, could you repeat that last last one, please? Uh, we, we measure interconnection points about the speed and quality of the internet around the world, and we make that data public. It's the largest public data set about internet performance that exists. So if, if people are interested in monitoring satellites, please come see me. Thank right. you. Okay, that's a lot. Carlos. Uh, hi. Carlos Rey Moreno, Association for Progressive Communications. Uh, my point is around whether it can close the digital divide or not. I think there are very laudable efforts, and we hear from Nigeria in, you know, in libraries where they have access to power, where they have access to free, you know, to pay the connectivity. But what does it happen in other communities where a unit that it needs, you know, 150 to 200 watts that costs a capex that is, you know, 300 to 400 to even 600 uh, US dollars? I mean, who, how do you upfront those costs when people don't have? actually money to get to the end of the month? How do you do the recurring payments? You know, like, I mean, there are many questions to actually consider this as a business model for the communities themselves or for the small operators. But then there is a real question that is being asked by some researchers that is the sustainability of Starlink itself. If it needs to continue, so, I mean, the, the environmental question is a real question that I would like to get answered as well, but would the Starlink continue being sustainable or it would be Loon 2.0? Right, Steve Song, one colleague of mine, has been starting to do that research in the economics of the amount of money that they require in revenue to be able to continue putting 
12,000 to 20,000 satellites in orbit to cover everyone when they cannot do more individual uh, connectivity, you know, uh, because it doesn't make sense because people don't have the money to pay for the CAPEX and the OPEX. I mean, is really Starlink going to be sustainable in five years? I don't know. Thank you. We don't know either. <laughs> uh, one more uh, here. Yeah, me. Um, I'm Teresinha. I'm from Brazil, and I'm here represent the youth program from the Brazilian Comité about internet governance. And actually, I would like to have the point of view from the, the speakers because um, talking about the Brazilian experience with um, the Starlink, I think we had a kind of naively expectations about how the Starlink would be great, the meaningful connective, especially in the Amazon region. But what we are seeing right now, especially me as a research, is that the Starlink has been most used in the Amazon region, in the really wild and remote areas to support um, illegal gold miners and drug trafficking. And they are ac <laughs> exactly the group who is killing the indigenous people and they are responsible to, for the indigenous tragedy. So uh, we had a kind of promise that the Starlink would provide internet for the, sc the, schools, the schools in the Amazon region, but it didn't happen. And so um, I understand that this is probably related to the um, affordability key, but I would like to hear from you what you think about that, especially because I think we, we need to talk about business advocates because I, if I know, I think people that work in Starlink know <laughs> that this broadband is being used to in order to <laughs> support illegal um, groups. So that's my point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All those are excellent and uh, difficult questions. There are many difficult questions with this technology uh, the, uh, and the system. There is the environmental impact. Uh, I should say that it may seem like we're promoting Starlink, but we are not. We're just pointing to it as a new and unique phenomena in the telecom ecosystem. It seems to us important what it is, how it works, what's an impact. Uh, this is a single global last mile network. That's really different. Now, what does that mean? Let's find out. It's really our, our case here. So. I don't feel I should be defending Starlink, or if anybody else wants to, they're welcome to, but uh, the, um, the, the, the satellite turnover, uh, impact, it, there, there are trade-offs. So for example, should we allow nuclear power to, to deal with the amount of carbon that's accumulating in the atmosphere? I'm completely against nuclear power generally speaking, but in the context of the crisis, maybe we have to. So I don't know if that's a good analogy, but I'm, I want to make the point about trade-offs. Uh, uh, so... Uh, it's going to take us a whole different path. Though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, this is great. Uh, Dan, I think you should uh, point everybody to your discussion environment that you have, where a lot of these issues are aired out every day. And I think that a lot of these could be dealt with there, uh, but take a shot at anything you've just heard and, uh, and also well, tell where people can yeah, go. I know, I, I know we're running at, we're hitting the end of time. And <clears throat> these are great questions. I mean, to the person who uh, asked about um, the environmental issues, there was just a paper published recently that's the first we've seen sort of in analyzing the research, uh, looking at the, the cost, the carbon cost of the launches of these systems. And, and that's a real question. And that, that is this trade-off. Can we use these as a system to go and, um, and connect the unconnected around the world? Can they be affordable? That's the huge question that's being asked here. Can they be that? I have a larger question. Right now, these are all being built by commercial enterprises. Do we want internet access from space to be only under the control of you know, several en commercial entities that are owned by eclectic billionaires? 
You know, um, the EU is taking a, a, a position with their IRIS constellation of trying to have one that is coordinated by a set of countries. Will there be other models? The larger question I was asked here, are these sustainable? We don't know. People have been around here for a while. will recall there was a Leo burst back in the 1990s with Iridium and, and Global Star and some other countries, uh, entities that were creating constellations for telephone access. And, and that, that petered out. It wasn't there. It, it, it died away. Um, although they're still up there. They're still being used. They're looking to come back in some ways for data. But, but it's a real question. The thing that we, and the, the importance of bringing it here is for people to understand that this technology is happening. It's going on. There are, you know, rocket launches happening every week that are putting more and more of these satellites up there. And, and we have to be, understand them. We have to understand where they can fit, what trade-offs we will make. You know, what are they? Is the carbon cost, you know, is the trade-off okay to be able to get the, the, the connectivity that we all need? Are there ways that we can mitigate that or make it better or do it? What happens to all these satellites when they burn up? Uh, it was somebody mentioned it there. We didn't really hit on here, but these things only have about a five-year lifespan due to <clears throat> the pull of gravity, atmospheric drag, lots of other reasons. You know, so they the satellite providers have to be constantly launching new satellites in order to keep these constellations up. Is that sustainable? Is there enough people who will buy it? Do there is there the capacity to support it? I don't know. None of us do. The measurement lab, a question around that. We don't have access to that data yet because a lot of it is all happening in proprietary systems. And also there's only one up there in full global operation right now. Lots of questions. These next five years are going to be uh, very interesting. And I think we all just need to keep our attention focused on there to see what are the opportunities? What are the trade-offs we have to make? Where does it all work? Will it all work? Very good, Dan. Uh, <laughs> there are more, of course, issues. Uh, we didn't talk about space junk. We didn't talk about uh, astronomy. Uh, we didn't talk about the stability of this billionaire. That uh, There are just a lot of issues. So tracking this is important. Involving everyone in it, or as many people that are actually interested in it, is important. So that these questions are not just here in a room, uh, but are part of the public debate. So I encourage everyone to uh, investigate more deeply into this extraordinary technology. And I'll take a prerogative here to add a use case uh, that is usually not mentioned. We talk about education, we talk about health information, access to public services and public information. But having a, a basically a, a connectivity point in a community that is impervious to disruption, to disasters, uh, speaking of carbon and weather, this is increasingly the world we've created and we're living in, we're going to be living in it uh, for the foreseeable. So all those people out there that also don't have access to educational opportunities, commercial health opportunities, are also people who are not contributing to the carbon accumulation but they are impacted more heavily by the results of what industrial economies have done. Giving them this capability is one very powerful way to give them uh, adaptation capability. And we think that's uh, part of the equation as we calculate how these things should go. So with that, we've run a little bit over, but I wanna thank our, our panelists and our audience and everyone involved in this. Thank you very much.